join you for helping them out tonight. And we thank God for all of you who are here. Uh, and thank you for this privilege he's given us to study his word one more time and to grow uh, in his word. He wants us to grow. Amen. He wants us to become better and more effective in our witnessing uh, for him. Because it is only when we witness for him that we realize who he is, what he's done, and what he can do. And uh, we just solicit from you continued prayers that we do his work and do his will and do it his way. Amen. And a lot of times you can do God's work, but you do it your way, and it don't achieve what he wants it to achieve. Amen. But if you do it his way, his will, his way, it, it makes a significant difference uh, in what we do. We are continuing to study in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, last week we did chapter 25, and uh, we saw uh, Nabal was an unkind neighbor, and he was an un In fact, his, 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 his servant called him son of the devil. Uh, because of what he did. And then, uh, you know, he got drunk, and uh, his wife, Abigail, intercepted David and his crew, 400 men, on and ready to kill everybody, um, and changed his mind. And she waited till uh, Nabal was sober the next day before she told him uh, what she had done uh, in taking all of those provisions to David and his men, and, uh, and and also she told him that David was coming to kill you and everybody in your family. And he was equipped to do it. Now, I don't know whether her telling him that he, she giving away all that food to David, or whether her telling him that David was getting ready to kill him. I don't know which one sent him into shock, but he went into a shock. And uh, one, I was reading a couple of interpretations today. One interpretation says the fact that he became as stone uh, implied that he probably had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. That was what one writer said. The other one implied that uh, as a result of the shock, uh, that he just could not regain his strength uh, because he was so taken back by the danger that he had put his family in by his choices, amen. And, and that's what I try to tell a lot of times these young people, you know, don't just think about yourself. You put other people in danger and amen. you make bad choices. Amen. And amen. nowadays you can make bad choices that'll put your whole family in jeopardy. Yes, sir. Because deep folks out here, well, I already we talked about it last night, talked about it last week. It, it's just a different, it's just a different world. Amen. It's a different world, and it's really uh, the world that Paul uh, and Peter talks about, but we really don't absorb uh, what they're trying to say to us about the wickedness and the viciousness and the ungodliness uh, that is going to permeate our world. Uh, in fact, Sunday we're talking about judgment out of Zephaniah uh, in our Sunday school lesson, and it has to do with uh, uh, our unwillingness to follow the directions of God. <clears throat> Amen. Our world was a more peaceful world. And let me just say, when I say world, I really mean America. Amen. Because that's the world we know. But you do need to know that's not the whole world. Amen. Amen. But our world was more peaceful when more people were going to church. Amen. Amen. And more people were praying. Amen. And more people were believing in God. Amen. I, I am really, should I say sad, I almost said appalled, but it, it's not really an appalling thing, it's a saddening thing uh, to, to know that over 60% of Americans don't believe in God. Mm. Amen. And in the 1940s, that was at 20%. Man. We're growing worse. You don't see it. 
You need to see it. For those that believe in God, that's why God talks about those that ain't too high. And if I can't get nothing else to you tonight, hold on to the faith Amen. that you have. Amen. There are a lot of things going to come against it. But I can say personally that my faith in God has been the key to my being able to do and, and to achieve some of the things that I wanted to achieve in life. Faith in God promises that. Read, read Joshua 1 and 8. I'm not going to read it tonight. But that's one of the ones I often refer people to. Joshua 1 and 8. He says all about your relationship with the Word. And your relationship with the Word affects your relationship with God. And if your relationship with the Word and your relationship with God is good, he said it's going to lead you to prosperity Amen. and good success. Amen. Good success. I said I wasn't going to read it, so I didn't read it. I quoted it. Uh, but, but that's what uh, the promise is. All right. Um, I look like I'm going to have to read tonight because um, I'm having a little issue with my uh, unit here, and I don't want to read on it. First Samuel chapter 26, verse 1. Is it working? Anointed and be guiltless. 
David said, Therefore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster and they got them away. And no man saw it nor knew it, neither awaketh, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of an hill afar off, a great space between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Asterisk thou not, Abner. Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, I just said to Israel, no, said to Abner, Are not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy Lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king, thy Lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master. The Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore does my lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done? Or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they because before the lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go, serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more thee thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's Spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into mine hand, to my hand today. But I would not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of 
all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt do both do great things, and also shall still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. All right, so reads uh, 26, my uh, glasses keep sleeping down, and these are not my last prescription. <laughs> no. Amen, but you know you like certain style. It's better than that glass prescription. I don't like the glasses that much, but I do need to be wearing them. Uh, but but uh, you see this uh, rendering of chapter uh, 26, and, uh, uh, and and one thing I don't know if you noticed it, but I uh, I certainly noticed it, is that uh, even though Saul said, I ain't gonna try to do you no harm, come on. <laughs> <laughs> David, David could have said, I've heard this before. <laughs> and uh, he turned right around uh, and, and chased after him. But, but what a, uh, uh, a picture of commitment to the Lord, that even when the Lord puts your enemy in your hand, you have mercy instead of demanding justice on them. Uh, and I don't know about anybody else, but I thank God for his mercy. Amen. Amen. I have fallen in his hands. Amen. Amen. He could have done some terrible things to me, and I would have been, been able to lodge a legitimate complaint. Amen. Amen. Because I was guilty. But, but, but David, uh, and, and as I said earlier, uh, and, and a couple lessons back, David had his flaws. Mm -hmm. But when it came to God, when it came to relationship with God, David put God as a priority. Amen. Amen. He didn't let women, he didn't let position, he didn't let power, he didn't let prestige, he didn't let none of those things stop him from serving uh, the Lord. Amen. Now, his son, uh, he, he wasn't quite as successful, amen, because eventually uh, the women got to Saul, I mean to uh, Saul, amen. Uh, no more discussion on that. Uh, they, they got to him because when he was young, amen, he could handle them 300. <laughs> got old, it was up to seven, eight hundred. Amen. And some of them were young, fresh out of the field. Amen. At, at first, he wouldn't let them bring nothing into the temple. Now, this is the history. I did it. I'm, I'm saying it jokingly, but it, it is it's serious. At first, he wouldn't let them bring nothing into the temple because it is sacred and it's dedicated to God. But as he got older, amen, y'all know how it worked. A young woman said, come on, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pray, my God, into your tabernacle, your temple. And stop, is it all right, baby? <laughs> all right, baby. <laughs> And, and honestly, now you all have to read that Solomon's story to really get there. But God came to Solomon and he said to him, if I had not promised your daddy, I would kill you right now and take the kingdom and give it to another. But your son won't be king. And his son became king. But God took the kingdom from him. Railbone, that's, that's the name you want to remember. Rehoboam, and uh, another high-ranking servant in the house uh, of, of uh, uh, Solomon, his name was Jeroboam. And the people preferred Jeroboam to Rehoboam. Mm. He was not even of the kingly order. But anyway, that's, that's a whole other discussion. We're looking tonight at uh, Saul in pursuit of David again. Uh, he goes after David. We're back. We're to the book now. Who again spares Saul 
And, and, and you know, uh, when people keep doing it and you keep sparing them, it kind of make you say, you know, I don't know. I'll say this about him. He did get enough sense that he didn't go back to the, <laughs> to the house with him. <laughs> he stayed away from there. How soon? You all see that? Do unholy hearts lose the good impressions, convictions have made upon them? We forget. Amen. We forget. I, I know we look back at the old days and say the good old days, but they weren't all good. Amen. 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 They had more peace in them. And, uh, and, and you all know people talk about uh, having the, the closest thing to a lot most people in the real deep south had was a wood latch. Amen. And the only reason they turned that latch was to keep the dogs from running in and out of the house and keep the doors from just flying open. That was the closest thing they had to a lot. Right. Amen. And people, you know, I heard them say, you know, we didn't even have to lock our doors back then. Right. Amen. Right. And some of them didn't. And the white folks had locks. <laughs> I forget this being taped. <laughs> but they had locks. Amen. You weren't going to watch him walk, walk into Mr. Joy Nolan's house. Because he had locks. But the other reason I tell people that we didn't have no locks, because we didn't have nothing in the house to first steal it. Amen. <laughs> Somebody had a broken eye house, and Mr. Joy made have left something. <laughs> So sorry for <laughs> but 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 our world uh, has dramatically changed, and we forget. Uh, a lot of times, do you think people forget when they've done wrong and repented, and God delivered them? What, what was that thing you said to God, Lord? If you get me out of this, and then after you get you out of it, you forgot what was going on when you were in it. Hello. How it was keeping you up, how it was messing you up, how it was really on the verge of destroying your life. You forget. We, we forget. And because we do, we go right back to it. Yes, sir. And, and uh, uh, the truth is that, that every time you drive the devil out and you let him come back, he comes back stronger. Amen. Drive him out, and you don't. Here's the key to keeping him out: you have to replace what you were doing with something positive. Amen. Amen. If you were going to the boat on Wednesday night, come to prayer meeting. <laughs> I'm not talking to y'all. I'm I'm I do need to say that Sunday though. Uh, but, <laughs> but if you don't replace it, see, we create voids. And the devil loves to fill voids. Right. Right. And he will fill the void in your life. And ultimately, his goal in filling that void is to make a mess of your life. Right there in, in the gospel, it tells about a man who cleaned out his house and uh, drove the devils out, and they came back and brought seven more. So now, the devil likes, I mean, the demons, uh, devil, whatever you want to call it. They like companions. Amen. If they can get you to steal, then they'll bring lying along with it. Hello? Mm -hmm. And lying is stealing, and you may not mean to hurt nobody, but you can end up hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. Hello? Because mm -hmm. if you try to steal something, I catch you. you One of us going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all, I'm not doing it. Hey, man, you catch somebody in your house. I know you want to say, look, just go on, take what you want to take. 
I'll be praying with you. This satisfies the need that you have in your life. <laughs> that you have a better life after this. <laughs> and that what we say? And that what we're supposed to say? What you lay hands on? <laughs> I know I know. <laughs> Amen. Give him a little encouragement. Amen. <laughs> Give him a little, give him a little encouragement. You won't come back in this house no more. <laughs> Amen. 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 Somebody continue to read that. How helpless were Saul and all his men. Look, look, Saul chasing David, not knowing David. With the Lord on his side, the Lord had already told him he was coming. Anybody believe the Lord warned him? Yeah. 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 And sometimes he warns you and you don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. But you know something is getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes you can't always put your hands on what it is. But if, whenever that warning comes, I go to praying. And whatever it is, you'll give me directions and help me to deal with it. Because I, 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 I feel the warning. But David knew that Saul and his men were coming. He brought 3,000. He didn't just get 3,000. Anybody, first 3,000 lined up. He got 3,000 of the best men. Yes. Right. Amen. And brought them in pursuit of David. They camped. Saul, I mean, that was a smart plan. He in the middle. Everybody else kept around him. You know, Abner and his immediate entourage, who was the uh, captain of his host, which is his, his, his security guard, uh, him and, and, and the rest of the men were right there close to some. But let me say this, no matter what protection you try to put up, y'all know that scripture says, except the Lord keep the house. Amen. If, except the Lord keep the city. If the Lord can keep your house, he can keep you, he can keep your car, he can keep your children. Amen. He can keep your job. He, he just a keeper. Amen. Amen. And, and I don't care what goes on on your job. When you walk in there, walk in there praying. Amen. Amen. When you get in your car and you're ready to get, go somewhere, take a moment to pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, Amen. And you don't have to be driving down the street, you know, praying. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I asked somebody, because a lady, years and years and years ago, an elderly lady uh, said to me at the church across the street, she said, uh, she said, you got one thing, you do one thing I don't like. She said, you don't get on your knees when you pray. She said, yes, ma'am. She said, I'll do that. I acknowledge what she said. She said, well, what are you going to do about that? I said, the proper posture of prayer is not your physical posture. Mm. The proper posture of prayer is not your physical posture. You can get on your knees, but if you don't humble yourself, yeah. you got to acknowledge God and that you are in the presence of the Almighty. Yeah. Humility is the proper posture of prayer. So you can pray anywhere, anytime. And you don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to fold your hands. And you can get prayer through. Because the proper posture of prayer is really, if my people call by my name, we do what? Lay out, stretch out, get on their knees, raise their hands. I think he says, hold on. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, those of you that want to. Read it. Humble yourself. Whenever you come to God, 
You need to, whatever positions you think you hold in life, you need to push them to the side and humble yourself uh, in the presence of the Almighty God. All right, someone, I, I asked someone, please read. I, I kept trying, but okay. my glasses. Yes, same time in the cave, didn't it? Yeah. When he was in the cave, he said, the Lord has delivered your enemies into your hands. Uh, David said, but he's God's anointed. And because he's God's anointed, I can't do nothing to him. But he said, his day to die is coming. Uh -huh. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. He said, I don't know where he's going to be. He even said he might be on the battlefield, which is where Saul was when he died, and Jonathan too. Mm. But David said, he won't die in my hand. Because I respect God's anointed. Now, the truth is, David wouldn't kill Saul, uh, and maybe in the back of his mind, he said, I'm God's anointed, I won't go up there. Because <laughs> they don't agree with me. If, if, if God is God, he can handle anybody. Amen. He really can. If God is God, and I know that he is God, continue to read. He will. David still resolved to wait till God thought fit to avenge him on Saul. He will by no means force his way to the promised crowd by any wrong methods. The temptation was very strong, but if he yielded, he would sin against God. Therefore, he resisted the temptation. Trust in God. Amen. You have to trust God. Amen. Look at somebody telling me you have to trust God. You have to trust God. You have to trust. Trust God. One thing I give David credit for is he did know how to listen. Last week he listened to Abigail, didn't he? And after she told him, said it, when you become king, you would you gonna regret having shed this blood, you would regret it. And he thought about that and he said, you know, you're right. You're right. And, and, and if you're not careful, the devil will make you make big deals out of small things. And if you respond according to the big deal, you done made it, you'll regret it later. I don't have to ask, I already know. How many have done something they regret? <laughs> and if you if you gotta think about it real hard before you can raise your hand. <laughs> All right, let's read on. Uh, David exhorts Saul 13 through the 20th verse. and his teachings don't matter. To the point that we start doing contrary to what God said. The, the writer is saying those are our greatest enemies. Anybody that drives a wedge between us and God, I'll tell you anybody, I'll tell all of you. Love your spouse. Love your, and, and, and I use this word, real carefully now, significant others. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going there. Love your family. 
love your children. Love your church. But don't let nothing come between you and God. Amen. Amen. Because people mean well. And they don't always mean to drive their wedge, but it's something driving them. It's the devil. Didn't he drive a wedge between Adam, Eve, and God? Amen. And, and mankind has been spending all the rest of his time trying to get back. And still couldn't do it until God sent his son, Jesus, who healed that breach, who healed that broken relationship. Don't, don't let it. It can happen to any of us. So you have to be conscious of what the devil is trying to do. You have to be careful of what the devil, and nobody's exempt from this, y'all. Right. Right. It, it took a, a, a very close preacher friend of, of mine to help me. To help me, because I saw uh, what was happening, but I, I didn't look beyond a person. And a lot of times, you gotta look beyond a person. Because the truth is, people don't know what they do. They say things, they do things, and then they say, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you can be sorry, but that don't really clear the slate. I, I hope y'all understand what I'm saying. But we got to learn how to forgive. Amen. But don't let nothing, nothing, and nobody, when I need to fall on my knees and pray, I don't need to have to get up and go apologize to nobody before I talk to them. Amen. I mean, nobody, you know, y'all heard the expression about a dead cat on the line and all that stuff. That I mean, <laughs> that's old country's terminology. But what it's talking about, it breaks your connection. And we can allow things to break our connection with God. And, and when I say, maybe you still, but you're not with, close with God like you were. And it's all because of what we allow to intervene in our lives. So, 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 uh, but Saul couldn't get it because of an evil spirit. And the scripture said it was an evil spirit from God kept coming upon him. Did you notice also in that first verse about when they were camped and everything that David and them slipped in, nobody heard him or saw him anything because God had allowed a deep sleep to come upon them. You know, anybody in here ever been so sleep you thought you were drunk? I mean, you couldn't. You, 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 you didn't know whether what you were seeing was real or false. Maybe somebody, maybe you were drunk. <laughs> maybe you weren't sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> But 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 uh, but 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 sometimes you can sleep so deep. But uh, anyway, yeah. uh, read on, please. Amen. David said to Saul, something driving you. Mm -hmm. If it's the Lord sending you to punish me for something, then I need to make a sacrifice or an offering unto it. And, and, and it, it, the, the uh, person, the, the lesson explanation leaves out a group. If, if it's people, David says, and when you go back to the scripture, if it's people that are driving you to chase me, don't let people mess you up. Amen. There's a lot of dead people. Dead because they let somebody. Man, I wouldn't take that. What did he say to you? Oh, no. Uh -huh. You need to do something about that. <laughs> Amen. And 
Now you are all fired up. And you go out and do something that you could regret. Don't let, don't let people. He said, if it's God, he said, if it's, if it's people, he said, if it's that, that old evil spirit in you, whatever it is, we need to stop this. We both need to make sacrifice. Isn't that what he says? Mm -hmm. An offering from us both. Let us join in seeking peace and to be reconciled with God by sacrifice. Amen. Right now, God wants the sacrifice of a penitent heart. He don't want you to kill no birds and you know, cut up no lamb. He wants a penitent heart. Amen. That's, that's the key. A broken and contrite heart. And when, you, when you're wrong, you need to be sorry. And don't be so prideful that you can't admit. You know, we all make mistakes. Yeah. And make bad choices, don't we? Yeah. But then there's always something that will drive us, if we're not careful, uh, to not humble ourselves in relationship with Okay, Saul acknowledges his sin. <clears throat> Amen. And as has already been stated, he said this before. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. He acknowledged, and, and we all know, we're not even going to say all of us know, but some of us know people who do that. I mean, they acknowledge, yeah, I was wrong, I was wrong. And they turn right around and do it. They don't learn from it. And I'm not sure if they don't want to learn from it or they don't want to change. Which one do you think it is? Both. Both. Okay. Thank you. They don't learn and they don't want to change. We need to learn. Yes, sir. I mean, my theory would be that the fact that they don't want to change would come first, then, then which affects them not wanting to learn to me. Well, it can go either way. Okay. You know, uh, people can say, I know this wrong, but I ain't gonna stop. Mm -hmm. right. Hello. Now here's what you don't want to say. Lord, if you want me to stop something, stop me. <laughs> you don't want to say that. The Bible already told you his way ain't your way. Lord, if you don't want me to drink, Stop me. Stop. Did your lip fall off? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, if you don't want me to be fully with this other woman's husband, stop me. God is my shepherd. 
Jesus is the good shepherd. He will guide you. The other thing that the shepherd does is guard. He guides the sheep. He guards the sheep. And then he provides for the sheep. He leads them where they're going to be comfortable. Anybody know what David said? He leads me beside the still water. You know what I'm saying? Why? Why he said that? Leave it aside, still one. Sheep are fearful of rushing water. They are fearful because if a sheep fall in rushing water, he's going to drown. His coat. Mm. And that's why a good shepherd leads his sheep by still water mm -hmm. so that they'll be at peace and have comfort. Mm -hmm. If he's going to give them a drink, he makes sure he finds a calm lake or something where they can drink from. That's the kind of God we have. He provides for us. Let me say this. As a Christian, your life shouldn't be chaos every day. Amen. And I'm not saying you ain't going to have no chaos in your life. But as a Christian, your life shouldn't be chaotic every day. Because God don't lead to that direction. God don't lead you into total chaos. He leads you to the still waters. He leads you through the valley of the shadow of death. And you should fear no evil. And the only reason you fear no evil because he's with Amen. But let me just say this to you. If, if you allow what's going on in the world to really take over your life, and without God on your side, you'd be scared to go outside. Amen. 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 Because we'd be so fearful. We have to believe that God is still in charge. No matter what it looks like, God is still in charge. Let's read Such a Saul acknowledges his, his sin.
because uh, in a couple more chapters, uh, Saul is going to uh, ultimately meet his his maker. Because, and, 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 and I always think of the story of Saul in the Old Testament as a sad story because it had a great beginning. And those of you that weren't here when we were studying, study his beginning, I wish you would go back and see how great the beginning was. He was taller than everybody, but he was so humble. He was so humble that when they said they wanted him to be king, he hid himself. And, and after he was anointed uh, by Samuel, uh, he, he, he turned uh, to go to where Samuel had sent him. And the Bible said when he turned, God gave him a new and he met prophets, and he started to prophesy. And he had the anointing of the Holy Ghost on him. That's why I say it's a sad story. He had a good end. I mean, a good beginning and a bad end. And uh, the Saul of the New Testament, he had a bad beginning and a good end. Uh, I'm working on a paper now called The Tale of Two Saul. Yes. How long did Saul chase, chase David? All his life. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, honestly, this was the last time he chased him. This was the last time he broke his word. But the reason was is because he was doing battle with the Philistines after this, and that's where he dies in one of those battles. But he chased him. Um, uh, the estimate is that it was three years from the time that he was uh, anointed by Samuel till he really became king. So Saul was trying to one prevent him from being king, and once he finally acknowledged he'd been he's gonna be king, he just wanted to kill him. He just had that in him in his heart, and it's bad to get something in your heart against somebody. Right. You have to pray. But, 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 uh, 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 but this is the last time, Joyce, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to, to validate. But I'm going to say this. Saul reigned for 40 years. David reigned for 40 years. Solomon reigned for 40 years. Hmm. All three of them, that was their reign. Hmm. But David only reigned uh, officially as king for 37 years. Huh? Well, yeah, I mean, well, he really, in reality, his, 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 his kingdom wasn't really established until he ruled from Jerusalem. So it's believed that was a period of 37 years. But he was king for 40. Saul for 40 and Solomon for 40. That was the uniqueness of their, of their reign. And after that, there was never a king in Judah or Israel that reigned for 40 years. They had some kings that reigned for six months. <laughs> they were in the habit of killing them, assassinating them. That was a bad position to be in. Because you always got some of what people don't like taxes. They don't like army. They don't like this. They don't like that. But the Lord, what did the Lord tell them when they said, we want a king? We want a king. He said to, he said to Samuel, he said, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Give them what they want. But here's what I want you to tell them. He's going to make soldiers out of your boys. He's going to make maids and concubines out of your girls. He's going to tax you. And everything you own, he's going to have something to do with So there's a good part, but then there's a bad part. But they had a crazy reason for wanting the king. Why they want the king? All the nations around us got a king. have kings. You know what Samuel said? You have a king. It's God. 
They said, yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, we like him. He all right, but we want a physical king. We want somebody we can touch. Yeah, I'll kill. <laughs> yeah, I'll kill. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, we laugh, but that's the way the, the world thinks. That, you know, we want... Lots of people who say they don't believe in Jesus. I mean, I mean that's the you know that's some the part of the reason they give. They don't want to, well. Well, I mean, well, the truth is, a lot of people don't want rules. And God is a God of rules. And a lot of people don't want Jesus Christ because He brought some more. <laughs> Hello. God never said love you. Yeah. Jesus did. Push this love thing a little bit farther. Love your enemies. I want to really change it. Do good to them that you know just got through talking about you. They blasting your name on Facebook. Hello? I like what Brother Matthew said. That the Lord don't hold me accountable for how you feel about me. He does hold me accountable for how you feel about me. How I feel about you. God bless you. Have a good day. Amen. Amen. Y'all remember what that I thought we were driving to Cincinnati. And I got back on the CD, so that's what I meant to say. And that's not what I had said. <laughs> Truth is, uh, David teaches us the right way to deal with your enemies. He teaches us. Amen. And as I said before, he had a lot of faults, but he knew uh, about God's anointed, and he knew that he was not only God's man, but he was somebody that he was to respect and to give proper recognition to. All right, next week, we're going to talk about David. Uh, go back to uh, Gath and, uh, and, and a couple other things. We, we, we're getting close uh, to the end of this particular chapter. It's going to be a great study. We're going to break. Uh, we have a summer break, Sister Ragland, from Ballot after we finish First Samuel. Amen. It won't be a long break, but as you know, I do travel, some traveling during the summer. And so... Uh, I'll let you know, but we should be finished uh, in the next three weeks or two weeks. Yeah, yes, ma'am. There's a difference between uh, me and our spirit and the evil spirit. Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah. Uh, a mean spirit, a lot of times, is just attached to a person who have a, has a mean disposition. And there are people who have just a mean disposition. Mm -hmm. They, they got something in them that just makes them uh, contrary people. And uh, an evil spirit is, is demonic in its roots. And, and, and the object of the demonic, some people are mean just because they don't want you to bother them. Now y'all can play that thing. <laughs> Amen. I had two hunts, ain't Rena and ain't you. We love Aunt Rena. She do anything. We look over at Aunt Chip. You didn't want to ask her now. <laughs> but, but you know, there are just people that have, and, and the thing is, she was just a strict person. You know, she just, she just, she didn't play with children. And, uh, but, but, so, do, do you want to? Wow. You understand those things. Some people just have it, and and a lot of times, you know, like I said, they probably want to be level on, and they know it. And they mean they go you know, leave them alone, you know. And then the evil spirit is one that's demonic in its root, and it's driven by Satan, uh, and its ultimate aim is to destroy you. And one thing the evil spirit does, it takes your joy. And it takes the joy out of life. Did you know that you're supposed to be happy? Happy. Mm. In spite of everything, God wants you to be happy. And he wants you to be at peace. 
Amen. And that ought to be our prayer. God, give me what you want me to have. And that's happiness and peace. And, 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 and you'll be happy if you don't predicate your happiness on things. Amen. Well, I got out of bed by myself. I'm happy. <laughs> Hello. Now, when do you appreciate that? When you can't get out of bed. Or when you don't witness somebody not having that ability. Doesn't it give you an appreciation for it? You ought to look somebody tell them you don't know how blessed you are. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege you gave us tonight to study your word again and for your people who want to know so they can grow and, Lord, become the servants you would have them to be. Thank you for giving us David as an example. Lord God, how we should treat others, especially those of the household of faith. Amen. Lord God, touch us where we need to be touched so that we won't have the issue and the problem that Saul had. Mm. And even though David had opportunity to do to him what he was trying to do in return, he didn't take advantage of it, but rather left it in your hands. Help us to leave some Help things in your hands yes. and believe you for your promise and for your word. He says, I'm with you. You said that you would take care of us. You said that you would provide. Help us to trust you and leave some things in your hands. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now one thing I see and I'm, and I'm happy about it is that uh, uh, when we come back, we're probably going to have uh, a children's Bible study. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Y'all helped that to happen. Keep bringing them. Uh, amen. We're going to have a children's Bible study. And uh, it's going to be a structured lesson. Not just going to be anything. But, but let me just say this. A lot of children don't know the stories that most of us have known most of our lives. Amen. Samson. And then not a lot of emphasis on the life. <laughs> uh, the story of Moses being born and being uh, put in a basket and the story of David and Goliath. Uh, what did I tell you? I watched it with my grandson. I think I told y'all that. That I was sitting up there watching with, our, with, with the grandson and he said, he said, God gonna knock that giant down. <laughs> so he was waiting on that part for the whole thing. Amen. He was waiting on that part. But God knocked that giant down. On the day of the It's called the skull because when you look at it, it's a heel. It's like a mound. It's not, when I say heel, a lot of people think it's, it's, not, it's really just a big mound. And it's got two openings on the side. And it's got an opening at the bottom. Place of the skull. It looks like a skeleton head. That's why it's called the place of the skull. That didn't have anything to do with David and Goliath. Uh, that was uh, really in a different area. It was in the Valley of Elah, okay, which is uh, quite a ways from Jerusalem. Jesus Christ was crucified right outside of Jerusalem on a hill called Thank you all. See you next. See you Sunday. Family, family friend day. Yes.
we will have free pass afterwards, and if you committed to dessert, a dessert, I know who you are. <laughs> I'll be looking 